So I am in Piazza San Marco in Venice to tell you a story about tech because right here is the flagship store of an Italian tech company. A company that most people don't even know about. A company that beat Silicon Valley and built the first desktop computer in a small town in Italy with a team of rebels. And just to give you an idea, this computer store next to a 500-year-old cathedral was selling computers back in 1967. And it's what modern-day Apple stores are modeled after. This is the story of how Italy was this close to becoming a tech powerhouse, a new Silicon Valley, a story of visionaries that build things you wouldn't see until 50 years later, of conspiracies and CIA involvement and how this all came to a very rough end. This is the crazy untold story of Olivetti. My name is Enrico and on this channel I go behind the scenes of the stories, psychology and design behind technology. And this particular story starts right here. This man working on the factory floor is Adriano Olivetti. His father, David Camillo Olivetti, is an engineer. He studied at Stanford in the late 1800s and there he saw the future, the typewriter. He was so struck by this device that when he came back to Italy he decided to open in 1908 his own typewriter manufacturing company, Olivetti in the city of Ivrea. Even though he's the head of the company, Adriano is working on the factory floor, but he despises the work. It's so monotonous and repetitive. But this is where he's inspired to build something different, a different kind of company. He becomes president of Olivetti in 1938 and he transforms the company into something that was never seen before and not just in Italy, but in the world. Thinking back at his grueling time in the factory assembly lines, he built new factories that inspire better work with tons of natural light. He starts bus services for his employees and provides never before seen employees benefits like libraries, theaters, he institutes nine months of maternity leave in the 1940s when the law only required two. He extends healthcare benefits to depression and psychological issues, something that was unheard of back then. In Ivrea, world-class architects are available to the employees that want to build a home. There's a free cafeteria with fresh food, we are in the 1940s. Plus, he was paying his employees 50% more than any other company at the time in Italy. He despised the ideas of tailorism, squeezing employees to the bone to maximize productivity. And instead he believed that a balanced and happy life brought more productivity at work than trying to squeeze every single minute from your workers. This is the same approach to work that modern tech companies take and he did it in Italy in the 1950s. This was unheard of at the time and it worked. In 1946 it took 12 hours to build a typewriter. In 1958, it only took 4.5. The size of the company, 10Xs. Exports are up 17X. They built typewriters that became massive hits worldwide, like the Lettera 22. In 1954, they opened a flagship store on Fifth Avenue, and Olivetti, an Italian company, bought Underwood, a historic US manufacturer of typewriters. At its peak, Olivetti had 25,000 people around the world working for them. Adriano didn't believe in profits. Everything should be reinvested into the company to innovate and innovating is exactly what he did. Olivetti was coming out with a new product every eight months at a time, something that is more in line with modern day Samsung than a 1950s company. And it's at this point that Adriano would stumble upon something that would change everything. After all, why would anyone building typewriters care about this new thing called the computer? You have this like sitting area here with design chairs very minimal, no pricing, no, it, this doesn't look like a shop. This looks more like an art exhibition than a shop. This is like 50 years before Apple stores. This is so ahead of its time. It's just crazy. Adriano starts to come into contact with electronics in the 1950s. The Italian government starts to buy some of the first computers at the time from MIT. Now, what I mean by computer here is a 5 ton, 4 by 2.5 meters beast. And he realizes that this is the future. Adriano flies to Columbia University to learn more about this new world of computers. And there he meets Mario Chu, a 28 year old Italo Chinese engineer. He is praised by everyone he worked with for his brilliance. And Adriano's not letting the occasion slip. He hires Mario and he knows exactly what he should do. Because you see Enrico Fermi, yeah, the same Enrico Fermi that you saw in the movie Oppenheimer that built the atomic bomb, in those days proposed to the University of Pisa to build an experimental center and build the first computer that was fully made in Italy. And Adriano signed a partnership with Olivetti to build this together. So in the small village of Barbaricina, surrounded by farmland and vineyards, now lies a world-class computing R&D center 
where a team of young engineers led by Mario 2 are working on building the first computer that was actually made in Italy. In the meantime, a new technology comes along, the transistor, something that's still to this day the foundation of computing. Just think that an M1 Ultra chip in a new Max, at its core, is just a bunch of transistors, just 114 billion of them. And of course, Adriano sees the opportunity immediately. While everybody was using vacuum tubes in 1959, they complete the first transistor-based, fully transistor-based computer in the world, the ELEA 9003. The electronics division now starts to grow, even outside the original research center, and eventually there will be more than a thousand people working in it. It will become the largest electronics R&D center in Europe. Just to show how forward-thinking Adriano was, he commissions Le Corbusier, one of the most famous architects of the past century, to design the new Olivetti Electronics HQ, with a dedicated highway exit, futurist design, hanging gardens. Does this sound familiar? But not everything is going well. The first cracks are starting to show, and this is the start of a spiral of death, conspiracy, and even the CIA allegedly getting involved. While Olivetti is making computers that are at the same level as other competitors in the global scene, these other competitors are getting subsidies from governments, especially in the US, who's investing heavily into R&D with potential military and industrial applications. In Italy, on the other hand, no one in the government is interested. And then suddenly, on the 28th of February 1960, Adriano Olivetti dies. He had a stroke on a train going to Switzerland. Adriano was a visionary. He believed in looking at the future. That's why he was pushing electronics so much. And he had this progressive philosophy of how a company should be run, with a care for employees and not just striving for maximizing profit. Unfortunately, the rest of the family wasn't like him. They inherited the company, and remember, at this time, Olivetti's bulk is still typewriters and mechanical products. The new leadership of the company sees this whole bet on electronics like something too ambitious. They prefer to focus on the reliable business of making mechanical products and typewriters. And then again, as if this wasn't enough, on November 9th, 1961, Mario Chu dies in a car accident. And at this time, he was working on a prototype computer that will come back later in the story. At this time, Italy is the Western country with the most advanced tech after the USA, making them a possible threat. And adding to that, Mario and Adriano started talks with China and the Soviet bloc looking for growth potential for their computing business. It was later alleged, but never confirmed, that both Mario and Adriano were under surveillance by the CIA for months before their deaths. Also, another interesting fact is that one ELEA 9003 computer that was supposed to reach a government building in Rome never arrived. It was lost during shipment. And this is not confirmed, but in the 1960s, some Olivetti technicians found a computer that was very similar to the ELEA 9003 in a large company in the US. The years that follow are the start of a spiral that would end up killing Olivetti. An economic slowdown in Italy combined with Underwood, the US company underperforming, meant that a complex web of ties with other Italian companies like Fiat and the government now looks like the only way to get Olivetti out of a desperate need for cash. In 1964, Olivetti does their first round of layoffs ever, something that Adriano has sworn to never do. And to make matters worse, they decide to lay off right from the electronics division. On the 18th of March 1964, a group of the most powerful industrialists such as Gianni Agnelli, the head of Fiat, politicians and members of the Olivetti family sit down at a meeting and make a decision that will probably be the most consequential in the history of Italy. To play the game of computers required big investments. And while in the US the government was funding this, in Italy they would have needed to self-fund this endeavor. And so they decide to sell the electronics division to General Electric. These people are far from the visionary genius that Adriano was. They are 1950s businessmen and politicians. Electronics and computers were just a novelty back then. Vittorio Valletta, director of Fiat, a car company that was involved in a sale, called the electronics division Uneo d'Estirpare, a mole to be eradicated. So is this the end of our story? They sold off the electronics division. There was no hope for it without investment, so this is where everything dies. Well, no. Hell no, because in the midst of this chaos and selling to General Electric and layoffs starts probably the craziest part of our story. A story of pirates, of rebels, of a small team that built something so unique that it would change things forever. This could easily be a modern day Apple store without any changes. Just replace these Olivetti machines with MacBooks and it'll be perfect. This is one of the old Olivetti calculators. 
Look at this design. Does this keyboard look? I would want this on my computer today. And the red accent? Come on. And by the way, this shop, you can visit it. It's open to the public. I'll leave in the description some info on where you can book your visit, but I really recommend it if you come to Venice. It's super cool. This is Pier Giorgio Perotto. He was an engineer working at Olivetti during those dark times. And he's the one that will be behind probably the most consequential and inconsequential product in Italian history. Probably even more than pizza, paved roads and the telephone. Yes, Alexander Bell didn't actually invent the telephone, Meucci did, but this is for another time. And this story gets even crazier, where General Electric arrived in Italy to inspect what they just bought. Perotto and the small team of engineers spent nights changing one word in the documentation of the company. They replaced the word calcolatore, which means computer, with calcolatrice, which means calculator. And at the time, that was a mechanical thing. And this way, they managed to keep some of the projects in Ivrea, outside the control of General Electric. They even painted the windows of their labs so that the Americans wouldn't see what was happening inside. So Perotto keeps working with a small team of computer scientists in the shadows. And during this time, he has an idea. An idea that started from the prototype that Mario Chu was working on when he died in that car crash. An idea for something that you're watching this video with, a personal computer. Something that could be used by relatively regular people, not by a team of specialists with a lab coat. It's 1962, they are working without official meetings, outside company guidelines, with a small team and simplifying to the core the big room-sized machines, inventing the Cartolina Magnetica, a way to store and load programs into the computer, which is basically the first version of the floppy disk. And finally, in 1964, they made it. They assembled the first personal computer. There was a RAM, a processor, a keyboard, a magnetic card reader, and a printer. It looks like a typewriter and it weighs just 35 kilos. They bring the prototype to Roberto Olivetti, the son of Adriano, who is still at the company and he doesn't seem so impressed, mostly because the thing looks terrible. So in comes the designer Mario Bellini, who designs a chassis in white plastic, minimal and ultra modern. Does this sound familiar? They also finally give it a name, the Programma 101. And so in 1964, the first personal desktop computer in the world was born. It was used by NASA for the Apollo program and even calculating trajectories for Polaris ICBMs. But unfortunately, this is a sad story. And it's about one word, quasi, almost. This typewriter company from Ivrea, in Italy, led by its visionary leader, became one of the most advanced computer companies in the world, pioneering a new way of thinking about work and employees. And after deaths, conspiracies, terrible decisions by bankers, industrialists and politicians, a group of pirates was still able with basically no resources and in secret to build the first desktop computer in history. Cheaper and better than anything else on the market. Olivetti had in their hands something that was a decade ahead of the competition, in a market that today is worth $200 billion. Olivetti actually had a chance to become a global tech company of the likes of Google and Apple, and leading Italy to become a powerhouse of technological innovation. Quasi. Almost. The Programma 101 was unveiled at an office equipment fair in 1965 in New York City, on a corner of the exhibition, with typewriters and mechanical calculators taking center stage. The leadership of the company saw there was little demand for desktop computers, so they thought, oh well, nobody would want this. Plus, now the factories were built to make mechanical products. You can't just make them churn out transistors and computers, and the division that could actually build this incredible achievement, the electronics division, was just sold off, eradicated. Like a mole, remember? And it doesn't take long for others to take advantage. Hewlett Packard realizes how much of a revolution the Programma 101 was, so they launched the 9100, straight up copying the P101, so much so that they eventually have to buy from Olivetti the patent for $900,000 in 1968. And so over the next years, Olivetti tries to gain back some of the people they just laid off, but it's too late. They lost the time advantage they had, and now they are off the race. Olivetti will then slowly fade into irrelevance. They will have a small moment again in the 80s, but it was short-lived. There is one key thing that I learned from this story. The visionaries, the people that actually build the future, the ones that create once in a century opportunities, they are 
sparks but it takes an environment of open minds they want to embrace the future and not fear it to transform these sparks into a fire leonardo da vinci and michelangelo were sparks but it took the environment of the renaissance in florence rome and milan in the 1500s to transform their genius into a real fire Jobs, Wozniak, Brin, Page, they were sparks. But it took the environment of Silicon Valley to transform their genius into fire. And as an Italian, this story hits very close to home because we were so close, we had the spark. We actually had multiple sparks, but a culture of looking at the past and fearing change make this spark just that, a spark, no fire. We could have been a country of not only beautiful nature and amazing history and great food, but also a powerhouse in global tech and industry, a beating heart where technology meets arts and humanities, not just a place where people want to go on vacation. Today, everywhere in the world, there are thousands of sparks, people that are using science and technology and new ideas to create positive change. But it's up to us to embrace this change e trasformare la scintilla in un fuoco.